Revelation chapter 9. I've been up all week pretty much at uh, Grapevine with my dad. He's doing very well. Appreciate the prayers. Uh, the surgery lasted about five hours, a little bit longer than they were expecting. And he is uh, up and walking around. They got him walking with a walker to kind of gain some strength. And so uh, he should be out of the hospital by Friday and uh, going to a rehab in Dallas to, to help get his strength back. So thank you so much for the prayers and uh, the thoughts uh, concerning him. Continue to pray for him as he recovers. Revelation chapter 9. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Holy God and Father, we're so thankful for every blessing you give us. We're thankful for the wonderful family that we have in Christ, all the blessings that we have in Christ, all the material blessings that we have from your hand. We're just so very thankful. We're thankful for this country and for strong leaders, and we pray that you'll bless President Bush and Vice President Cheney as they continue to lead our nation. We pray that we might uh, live a life in this nation of godliness and peace. We pray that your will will prevail. We pray for the church here and those who are sick in our number, those who are struggling, pray that you'll be with them. Help us to reach out to them and to show them the love that we are to show to one another and help us to reach out to this community with the gospel. Help us to be the evangelists and to be the proclaimers of your word that we should be. Forgive us of our sins as we have sinned in thought, word, and in deed. We repent of that and we pray, Father, for forgiveness and we trust your mercy and grace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 9. You know, when you look at the election coverage this past week, I've come to the conclusion that there just might be hope for this nation. There just might be hope. But we're going to talk about the Roman Empire in which the book of Revelation is saying, in essence, there is no hope for the Roman Empire. The reason is, is because they are persecuting God's people. And when you persecute, when you speak against, when you kill, when you harm God's children, God takes that personally. Because you're doing it to His Son, because they're in His Son's body, the church. And so you have in uh, the book of Revelation, you have God speaking in very colorful, very symbolic language, talking about, his wrath against the Roman Empire because they are persecuting His people. We've been looking at seven angels that are sounding seven trumpets. And when we come to chapter 9, the fifth angel sounded, and we saw this bottomless pit open up, and you see these uh, locusts, and they're graphically described in verses uh, 3 through 12 these creatures that represent symbolically moral corruption within the Roman Empire. As we talked about it the last time that we had our study, sin is like the poison sting, the poisonous sting of a scorpion. It infiltrates the body and it is something that does severe damage. Well, it's a plague in a society, just like a locust plague is a plague in a society. The people of the ancient world were very familiar with the, the, the swarms of locusts that would become so thick it would just block out the noonday sun. You'd have a cloudless day, but you'd have a swarm of locusts come into a region and it would be so thick that it would be like the sky was getting cloudy. And it was just simply a swarm of locusts. And those locusts would come down and they would wipe out crops. It was a plague. And so moral corruption within a society is a plague. And I believe that's what's being described in Revelation chapter 9, 
verses uh, 1 through 12. When you come down to verse 13, I forgot to flip the switch. But Paul told me not to forget. Revelation 9 and verse 13, you have angel number 6 sounding. They're blowing a trumpet. And remember, we talked about the significance of blowing a trumpet. It was symbolic of calling forth an assembly or calling the armies together for battle. And so these angels are, 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 are blowing the trumpets and they're announcing, in essence, the, the doom that's coming upon the Roman Empire. Revelation 9 and verse 13, Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Of course, this is talking about symbolically the golden altar that is uh, reminiscent of the, the altar that was in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. You read about that in the book of Exodus. And so you remember earlier in the book of Revelation, the saints were under the altar. And they were praying to God, when will you avenge our blood upon the earth? When will you avenge those who have taken our lives? Well, God is doing that in this process of, uh, of judgments upon the Roman Empire. Verse 14, Revelation 9 and verse 14, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now remember, four is one of our symbolic numbers. And if you remember the significance of four, it represents something of the earth, something that's going to happen on the earth. There are four directions. The Bible speaks of the four corners of the earth, referring to the four directions. And so here is an event that's going to happen on earth. And so you have four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. We're going to see the significance of Euphrates a little bit later on. Verse 15, So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Verse 16, Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. Verse 17, And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, blue, sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Of course, we know that this is talking symbolically. This is not literal horses that have this imagery here. It is symbolism. Verse 18, By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. Verse uh, 19, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons or idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So here you have the ones who are going to receive this punishment. Now you remember back at verse 4, Revelation 9 and verse 4, that the locusts were not going to harm those who have the seal of God on their foreheads. And remember, this, this is talking about moral corruption. The seal of God on their foreheads takes the mind back to Revelation 7 verses 1 through 8. That of 144,000 that were sealed. It's talking about the church symbolically. Sealed because they were willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. And God symbolically is putting a seal on their foreheads and saying, You belong to me. If you're willing to suffer for me, if you're willing to go through everything that you're going through to be a Christian, then you're mine. A person like that's not going to be involved in moral corruption. So the, the locust did not harm those Christians who were sealed uh, by God on their foreheads because those locusts represents moral corruption. And a, and a Christian that's willing to suffer for Christ is not going to be involved in moral corruption. 
And so what you have here in verses 13 through 21, you have depicted external invasion. That's one of the ways that the Roman Empire fell. Remember, internal corruption was one of those ways, and external invasion. They had internal moral corruption, verses 1 through 12. In verses 13 through 21, they had external invasion. The borderline of the Roman Empire was about where the great river Euphrates is located. And there was a group that was not a part of the Roman Empire called the Parthians. And if you study history, you know about the Parthians. The Parthians were some of the Rome, Roman soldiers' worst enemies. And they were horsemen. They fought on horses. Now, do you see the significance here? The Parthians, who were around the area of the Euphrates, who gave the Romans, the Roman uh, soldiers, the most problems, were valiant fighters on horses. So that's exactly why you have the imagery here of God speaking of these uh, armies, or this army, verse 16, coming from the area of Euphrates, and he says they are horsemen and depicts these horses as something fierce. These are something that are, 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 are fearsome. They're going to do a lot of damage. In fact, they're going to do damage coming and going. They're horses and their tails are serpents or snakes. So they're going to get them coming and going. The imagery there is of a fierce warrior that rides a horse. And so here you have in verse 16, the, uh, the men of the horse, uh, uh, the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And so it's representing a vast number. Of course, again, the Parthians were the ones who gave the, the Romans the most trouble. They were, uh, they were skilled horsemen. And they did a great amount of damage in battle on their horses. So the imagery here is very clear of the, the problems that the Romans are going to uh, find themselves in with this external, external invasion of these Parthians that would come. Now the question that's going to be in John's mind, the Apostle John who's recording all this and seeing all this, and we're going to, we're going to come across this question, and it's not going to be stated in so many words, but I think you can... You can find the implication there in chapter 10. Is, will this happen in my lifetime? Will this happen, John is thinking, in his lifetime? All these judgments, all these woes that are going to come upon the Roman Empire. So in chapter 9, you have in verses 1 through 12, you have the moral corruption depicted by the, the demonic locusts. And verses 13 through 21, you have this great army of 200 million, which, of course, is a symbolic number just depicting a vast army. I mean, if you see uh, an army of 200 million, you're, you're going to be concerned about your well-being and the well-being of your nation. And so the imagery there is a, a, of this ex external invasion there in verses 13 through 21. Any question about uh, chapter 9? before we get into uh, chapter 10. We're seeing how that God is using things to, to bring about the fall of Rome. And even in this, even in these circumstances, God is warning those of Rome to repent. He's wanting as many people within the Roman Empire to get themselves right with him uh, before the, the final downfall. And that's why it states in verse 20 and 21, uh, after all these things, uh, those who, who were not killed uh, by these plagues, verse 20 of uh, chapter 9, they did not repent of their works. Talking, and it goes into detail talking about all this idolatry. They didn't repent of it. They did not repent. So in all of this, uh, these tragedies that's coming upon Rome, it's as if God is shaking them up and saying, look, you're about to fall. You're about to, to come to an end. 
And so many of them uh, did not repent and do what's right. And so they, they were swept away by the invasion and all those things. So uh, that shows the, the problem there of people's stubbornness. I mean, tragedy after tragedy after tragedy can come upon a person's life. Sometimes it's because of their own action. And sometimes it's uh, beyond their control. And they still won't get right with God. They still will not repent. And so it just shows human nature how stubborn man can be. And we're going to see it again later on in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, you have here the, the whole chapter depicting almost a, a, a pause. We're not going to come to the, the sounding of the seventh trumpet by the seventh angel till chapter 11. So there's almost a pause here in the events. Six angels have already sounded six trumpets. The final one, the seventh, will be in chapter 11. But in between there, there's like this pause or this prelude to the, the uh, seventh trumpet being sounded. And remember, there were no chapter and verse divisions when all this was written. So these chapters and verses are arbitrary. They're, no, they're not inspired. They're put there to help us find things. Verse 1. John the Apostle said, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. So here, here John is seeing another image here, and he calls it a mighty angel coming down out of heaven. Remember, in this imagery, in this theatrical imagery, and this is what it is, it's kind of like a theater. When something comes up out of the ground, like out of the pit, the bottomless pit, that's demonic. That's not good. That's from the devil. The locust, remember, came out of a bottomless pit. That's not a good thing. But when something comes down out of heaven, that represents something good, something from God. So those are some things that... Uh, you can put in your mind to help you uh, help you out with this imagery. This is a mighty angel that's coming down out of heaven. And we're going to talk about here in just a moment how big he is. He's clothed with a cloud, clothed with a cloud, and he has a rainbow on his head. We came across the rainbow in chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, there was a rainbow over the throne of God, representing, of course, uh, God's covenant, God's uh, covenant back to the time of Noah. Uh, his face was like the sun. He was radiating, and his feet were like pillars of fire. Verse 2, he had a little book in his hand, a little book or a scroll. Of course, they didn't have books like we're familiar with, with pages. But they had a scroll, and, they, and sometimes translated book. He had a little book um, open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So this is showing how enormous... This angel is. He can put one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. Verse 3, And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. So again, talking about the majesty of this angel. as He's speaking as a lion roars. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Verse 4, Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. There's that number seven again, the number of completion in, uh, in the symbolic language of the book of Revelation. There were seven thunders that uttered their voices. A message was given, and John was about to write it down, but then he was told to seal up the things that were said and do not write them. We came across the, uh, the, the command to seal up a prophecy in Daniel chapter 12, if you remember. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel was told to seal up the prophecies of his book. The reason why is the things that he, were ta he was talking about in his prophecies were going to be fulfilled years, hundreds of years down the road. And not immediately in his lifetime. 
So that has some significance there. Look at verse 5. And that goes back to what I said earlier about the question in John's mind. The angel who I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven, verse 6, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be uh, delay no longer. Or some translations might say, no more time. Delay no longer or no more time. Verse 7, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, that's the angel that's going to sound in chapter 11, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. And he declared to his servants, uh, he declared to his servants, the prophets. What do we have going on here? Well, you've got to read the rest of the chapter, I think, to kind of get the flow of what's going on. Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me and said again, Go take the little book or the little scroll which is open in the, in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. Verse 9, So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. So John goes up to this mighty angel and takes the scroll and he eats it, and he's told that this will be sweet to your taste, but it will be bitter in your stomach. Verse 10. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as the honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Verse 11. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Verse 11, I think, is key to understanding what's going on in verses 1 through 7. That goes back to what I said earlier about John having a question in his mind. Is all this going to happen at once? And the answer seems to be no. You seal up the prophecy there in verse 4. Seal up the things that the seven utterances said and do not write them. And he says in verse 6, the angel says uh, that there will be no... No delay any longer. Verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, this is what will happen. The mystery of God will be complete. The word mystery simply means something that's hidden that's going to be now revealed. And so here's what I think is going on in chapter 10. I think John is thinking in his mind, are all these things that I'm seeing going to happen immediately in my lifetime? And he's getting the answer, no. They're not going to happen immediately in your lifetime because of verse 11. You must prophesy again about many, uh, about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So there was further work for John to do. Now, John was an old man by now. Very old man. Even by our standards. But he still had a work to do. And according to history... John was released from his uh, uh, imprisonment, his exile, from the Isle of Patmos, and he went back to the city of Ephesus. And some traditions say that he started a school for preachers in the city of Ephesus and taught men to preach. And so if that history is true, and we have no way of verifying that as a fact or not, it would go along with what's being said here. You still have further work to do, John. So no, this is not all going to happen in your lifetime. But he, he says something to uh, John in verse 9, or excuse me, in verse 8. Go take the little book which is open in the hand who stands uh, of the angel who stands on the sea and the earth. And he was told to take it in verse 9. And he took it and he ate it. What, what is that symbolism there? That's kind of strange to us. But it would not be strange to someone who was familiar with the Old Testament. The Bible oftentimes talks about us eating God's Word. Hold your place here and turn to Psalm. <clears throat> Psalm 119. This is imagery found throughout the Old Testament.
Psalm 119, <clears throat> verse 103. David writes, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So, so the psalmist here is talking about God's Word and how sweet it is. And that goes along with exactly what John was told. It's going to be sweet to your taste. It's going to be sweet in your mouth. Look at Jeremiah chapter 15. Look at uh, chapter 15, Jeremiah 15, verse 15 and 16. Uh, Jeremiah says, O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. Jeremiah is talking about the suffering that he was enduring because he was a prophet of God. That exactly parallels what the Apostle John's going through on the Isle of Patmos, and notice what he says in verse 16, Your words were found, and I ate them. Your words uh, was to me, your word was to me, the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Your words were found, and I did eat them. I did eat them. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2, God's talking to the prophet Ezekiel and commissioning him on his work. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 6, And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions. Do Notice that scorpions there. In the midst of a wicked society. That imagery of scorpions, it kind of goes along with what we looked at in chapter 9. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house, verse 6. Verse 7, Ezekiel 2 and verse 7. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. Verse 8. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that house, about like that rebellious house, Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Verse 9. Now when I looked, there was a handed me uh, uh, a stretched, outstretched hand to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Verse 10. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and, the, and written on it were lamentations and mournings and woe. So this is what he was to preach. It was God's word, and he was to take it. And God said, eat it. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly, and fill your stomach with the scroll that I have given you, or I give you. So I ate, and I was, uh, I, I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Like honey and sweetness. Verse 4. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. Now notice that. The psalmist talked about God's word being sweet to the taste. It's like honey. Uh, Jeremiah talked about God's word being sweet to his taste. Ezekiel was told to take the scroll and eat it. Same imagery you find in the book of Revelation. Told to John, you take the word, you eat it. It's going to be sweet to you. But, then, but before all that, he gives them a warning. Verse 6 of Ezekiel 2. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or be dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. 
In other words, you're going to go to a people who are stubborn and rebellious, and I want you to preach my word anyway, and don't be concerned about how they look at you. You take my word and you eat it. And what happens when you eat something? You're ingesting it. You're assimilating it into your system. It becomes a part of you. You've heard the phrase, you are what you eat. We have to remember that if we want to eat healthy, and be healthy people. I have to remind myself of that all the time. It's not easy. But we are what we eat, and that's true spiritually speaking. We are what we eat. And what John is being told is the same thing that the other prophets were told. I'm going to give you this word symbolically in a scroll. You take it, you eat it, you let it become a part of you, then you preach. You preach what I give you. And he's told here, Ezekiel's told here in Ezekiel 2, don't be afraid. You're going to have trouble when you preach. There's going to be briars and thorns. You're dwelling among scorpions. They're going to sting you. And he says, you go out and you preach anyway, and you don't be afraid of how they, what they say to you or how they look at you. I know as, as a preacher, I don't have a vast amount of experience, but in the little experience that I do have, sometimes you can preach sermons or teach a lesson, and if you strike a nerve, you'll see it in the people's face. And they'll look at you so mean. I've said things before, and I'll tell you, if looks could kill, I would have already been dead. I would have already been dead. And that's exactly what Ezekiel is talking about, or God saying to Ezekiel, you don't be afraid of what they look at or how they look at you. You don't be concerned with that. You take in my word and you go preach it, and you're dwelling among people that are like scorpions. He says, you preach it anyway. Now, when you bring it back uh, to John in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Revelation chapter 10, he's told to take the book and eat it, and it will be sweet to his mouth, sweet like honey, but at the same time, it's going to be in his stomach bitter. And then he's told in verse 11, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So John had a further work to do, so he was told to take in God's Word and go out and preach it. Now, we don't take in God's Word the same exact way as John did. John was a prophet. But we have God's Word revealed to us, and we're to eat it. Ingest it. That means we study it. It becomes a part of who we are. And it nourishes us spiritually. What did Jesus say in the book of John? I am the bread of life. He is the Word of God and He is the bread of life. Well, how do you feast upon that bread except by studying the Word and learning who Jesus is, learning His character, learning what type of person God wants us to be, Christian women, Christian men, young people, old people, the kind of congregation God wants us to be. We can't know that unless we feed upon God's Word. And so when we do that, we must understand that it's going to be sweet but at the same time, sometimes it's going to be bitter. It's going to be bitter. It's going to be bitter sometimes. Uh, when you put it in the context of John's preaching, John's going to be preaching and he's proclaiming this message of, of salvation. You, we find that in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. Uh, God has provided salvation and redemption through His uh, Son, Jesus Christ. That's sweet. That is Wonderful. That is good news. But the bitterness comes when he pronounces woe upon the Roman Empire and all those who oppose Christianity. There comes the bitterness. God's Word is sweet, and at the same time, it is bitter. And that is the, the message of the Bible because we have to understand who God is. Look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. I think you see the, the sweetness and the bitterness of God and His Word found in Romans 11 and verse 22. 
Paul says, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. The goodness and the severity of God. The goodness, there's the, the sweetness, tastes like honey. But then there's also the severity of God. There's the bitterness in the stomach. There's something that's bitter. It's not pleasant. And that shows the, the nature of God here. And he says, on those who fell, severity. Of course, those talking about those in context there of chapter 11, talking about Israel. But towards you, goodness, condition, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. So there's the good news and the bad news, so to speak. There's the, the sweetness as, as honey and then the bitterness in the stomach. And, and John was to preach and to prophesy uh, this message about God's good news. But at the same time, as he's writing the book of Revelation, he's got to write about the impending doom upon the Roman Empire. And in principle, it applies to any nation or any people that opposes Christ and his church. There is doom coming. So there is the bitterness. So oftentimes in our society, we want to preach on the goodness part and not talk about the severity. Let's talk about the goodness of God. And I love to preach on the goodness of God. The grace, mercy, and compassion. you got, you got all that in the Scripture concerning that. Let's talk about all this goodness and how we should love one another. But if you just stay in this area of goodness... You're forgetting about the severity. And in the severity of God, sometimes we've got to talk about church discipline. Sometimes we've got to talk about rebuking those who need to be rebuked. Now that's the bitterness. That's something that's not pleasant. But it has to be done if we're going to be the people God wants us to be. It's sweet, but at the same time, it is bitter. And so, you know, as, as proclaimers of God's Word, uh, preachers from time to time, uh, they might dwell too much in the severity and neglect the goodness, but I think more often than not, we dwell too much in the goodness and then neglect the severity. You know, you can't talk about heaven without talking about there being a hell. You can't talk about life without there being death. So it's the, the balanced understanding of God not being negative all the time, but not being uh, positive all the time. You know, a battery won't even work that way. If it's just positive or just negative, it has to be balanced. And so John here, the imagery here is God uh, giving John this message, this word. He is to ingest this word and he is to proclaim it. And sometimes that is a bitter, sweet thing. And as John is going to proclaim this message uh, to the Roman Empire, it's going to be a message of good news to those who would obey. It's going to be sweet, but a message of severity to those who would disobey. Any questions or comments about that? So I, I, I believe... Revelation chapter 10 is uh, dealing with, yes, John, judgment is coming upon the Roman Empire. It's not going to happen all at once. It's not going to happen all in your lifetime because, John, you have further work to do. And how much longer he lived after that uh, is only speculation. We know that he is the only apostle that died a natural death. All the others were killed. Uh, for their faith. We get into chapter 11. I'm not going to get very far into it for time's sake because there's so much in it. But you get into chapter 11 and verse 1. You have the measuring of the temple. Revelation 11 and verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And an angel stood saying, Arise, measure the temple of God, the altar, 
and those who worship there, verse 2, but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city for 42 months. Understand by this time, by the time that John is, is uh, seeing this vision on the Isle of Patmos, which is probably around the early to mid-90s of the first century, the temple has already been destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. So he's not talking about a physical temple. Well, what temple exists beyond the first century that exists even to this day? What temple? The church. Apostle Paul tells us that we are the temple of God. The Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are living stones in a holy temple. A holy house belonging to God. And so here you have the concept, we're, we're going to get into it uh, deeper next week, of John measuring the temple. And he uses the word for temple there, the Greek word, I believe it's naos, I believe that's the word. It refers to the temple building itself. There's a different Greek word that refers to the whole complex of the courtyards and everything. And when it talks about Jesus going into the temple, He didn't go into the temple building itself. He went into the courtyards. And so, the temple there, symbolically, is representing the church. And John is going to be told to measure it to see if the church measures up. Think about that imagery. Does the church measure up? And so, we'll talk about that more next week, Lord willing.